uh, leadership is something which uh, you cannot buy. Uh, something has to be earned. And I would summarize the characteristics as number one, circumstances. Circumstances are the ones that mold leadership. The circumstances come challenges. A nation can rise to the peak, facing challenges, and it can go into utter decline when there are no challenges. Secondly, conviction. There has to be a core value system. As in Judaism, there is a core value system. And I define a core value system as an acknowledgement that there are certain absolutes. Uh, nothing is relative. There are certain things that other societies can do that Jewish society can never do. Because ingrained within its genes, uh, by the centuries of our history, uh, is a core value system which begins with the uh, that you, you choose life. Uh, the sanctity of life. Number three is a capacity to say, follow me. Even when you are in a minority, to be, see, to be so convinced of the justice of what you represent, or of the need to face certain challenges under certain given circumstances, that you are ready to be the first one to jump into the Red Sea. Uh, then you have to have a certain naivete. Not to be so sophisticated that you always see every side of a problem. Uh, that can, uh, that can uh, freeze a man, uh, paralyze him. I use the word naivete, not necessarily in the dictionary sense, but in the sense of inner passion. And not all inner passions are rational. These, based on, upon my own experiences, as I observed the various leaders with whom I've had the privilege to work and learn from, uh, all these come together, which creates, in political terms, you call it fire in the belly. Now the world is speeding along, spinning at a pace in which unless you have the inner restraints and this to me is the meaning of halakha not just a lifestyle. It's much deeper than that. It is part of the core value of a human being his self-value or her self-value. That is what distinguishes us from the animal is self-restraint. And halakha comes along encompassing a number of things. One is self-restraint, the other is by this self-restraint if you live by it you will gain nobility, both of body and of spirit. And it is the very antithesis of instant gratification which technology has given us. And that's what I mean by a war of attrition. Now this requires a... This requires 
this requires a, a intellectual decision. When a young man or a young woman is setting out into the world, he or she has to decide what kind of a home he or she wants to build. And that is the beginning of leadership. It begins with the acknowledgement that we're going to have a family one day. And that brings with it the responsibility of leadership. Because the heart of education in and of itself is leadership. An essence of leadership among others is the capacity to make the decisions shaped, molded, driven by this core belief. And this is the very opposite of what the technology, which is a, a, a blessing in and of itself. We say on Shmon Esrei, Atachonin Ladam Dat, the Rebona Shalom, has given us brains. And we have used those brains magnificently. But just as uh, so many things in life, uh, it can be a double-edged sword unless it is guided and it is anchored and it is disciplined. Otherwise you become its slave instead of its master. Go to Tel Aviv on a Friday night and it's the in thing to go to a lecture on the parsha Hashivu of the of the portion of the week of the Torah. You may go to a discotheque after that. But an intellectual curiosity is flowering in this country, which has a very Jewish vernacular. It may be as a result of the fact that the new generation of youngsters still have to don uniforms, shoulder weapons, and go off to hazardous places we often don't know where. It will be one of the quandaries of Judaism. To what extent has the Jew remained a Jew because of that inner core conviction? And to what extent is he a Jew because he's been coerced into remaining different Jewishly by the suppressions and the persecutions of the non-Jews. More important than the political leadership is what's happening within the young generation at large. And the young generation at large either said I'm fed up with all this war, constant need for defense, which takes a minimum of three years out of my life to join the army and put myself in harm's way, and he leaves the country. Or, if he stays, he has to grapple with this. And I'm speaking about my grandkids and their friends, and I I, 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 I'm frequently invited to lecture in army units, not least on the officer level call. And I hear them, what they're saying to me. Now they have to rationalize what they're doing. Because the way things are going, the chances are their kids will also have to go into the army. This is a a testing ground of conviction in the profoundest Jewish sense. And this is echoed in the words of our leaders. Uh, even as I speak now, uh, we, are, we are being threatened by Iran with a nuclear bomb, no less. They, want, they might want to one day take a lucky strike at Tel Aviv. These are existential issues. We've lived with them all our lives. But then, Israel has thrived, has prospered. It's as if every challenge that is thrown at us 
Yes, they bleed us. Uh, we've fallen over obstacles. We've made wrong decisions. But at the end of the day, we've emerged stronger than we were before. When I came to Israel in 1947, there were 600,000 Jews in the country. And then we became a million, two million, three million, four million, five million, and now six million. And within the ethos of Israel's society, it's not necessarily expressed in words, in the ethos, the inner soul, is a conviction that we are the representatives of that other six million. He said, let me tell you what I try to do. I'm quite this in verbatim. Let me tell you what I try to do. Imagine you, you, you open a cupboard and you're looking at a candle. But what you're really seeing is a mere lump of wax with a thread down the middle. So when did this lump of wax and thread become a candle? In other words, when do they fulfill the purpose for which they were created? It's only when you bring a flame to the thread. There's a lump of wax, and so become a candle. And that's what I try to do. That every person should fulfill the purpose for which he or she was created. And then his voice lilted into the Gomorrah kind of resonance. The wax is the body and the wick is the soul. When you bring the Asha Torah, the fire of Torah to the soul, then the body will fulfill the purpose for which it was created. And that's what I try to do, to ignite the soul of every Jew with Torah so that they can fulfill the purpose for which they were created. At that point, my head was spinning. It was after two in the morning. And the, the system there in 770 was only the Rebbe could open the door, his door. Outside, they would buzz. People were queuing up, they came on over from all the world, and I'd been sitting with for hours. So, it's, it, it, they could only but and he had a button which he could press, which had unlocked the door. And that, was, that buzz was buzzing, and every time we were saying, Henach, Henach, it's all right, it's all right, relax, relax. And we carried on talking. Now, I, I got up, and I walked towards the door, and paused, and the Rebbe came to me. And he clasped me by both hands. And I said, I always spoke to him in the third person. I said, Ha'ime Rebbe, he'd lick it and actually, has the Rebbe lit my candle? He said, no. Nusati l'cho esa gafo, rak ato y'cho lahad lik esa nershel cho. I've given you the match. Only you can light your own candle. If you could uh, convey a message to young people living outside of Israel, young people the same age as you were when you made that momentous decision to leave your hometown and travel to Israel, what would be your message as as of today, <clears throat> to these young people. Look around you and have the wisdom. This is a young boy and girl. It's not an easy thing to sit down with oneself and think beyond the immediacy of what's happening around you. Get through it. Think through it. Get to the other side and think, what do you want to be? It's only in a matter of within five years. You, you would have almost already graduated 
from a college, from a university, from a vocational education, from whatever. And you enter as your own master or mistress on your own responsibility to run your own life. Now what kind of a life do you want that to be? Can you switch on your television and honestly say to yourself, this is culture, this is ethics? This is how you want to bring up your own children? Can you walk into whatever city centre you're living at and say, on a Saturday night, and say, this is what I want to become? Am I going to be a slave of this culture which surrounds me on every side? Or am I going to shape my own life Get through the immediacy of what's pounding you every day, 24 hours a day, telling you to embark upon a lifestyle in which you become a slave to your senses instead of controlling your senses. Uh, of course, we've all got passions. But a slave is one who allows the passions to dictate behavior, not the other way around. Freedom, the euphemism for freedom is Torah, is when you are able to control those passions. So it's an intellectual decision that you have to make. It's not easy, it was much easier in my time than it is in your time. But if you take yourself aside with a friend, three friends, five friends, talk about it. Because there are people out there who are ready to assist you in, and guide you in making decisions that are going to affect your whole life for better or for worse. So choose the ones who are going to assist you with wisdom and not just with instant gratification.